like to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Arthur Versluis. I'm a uh, professor and uh, chair in the Department of Religious Studies in my College of Arts and Letters. Uh, I assume you can hear me. Is that correct in the back? No problem? Good, I see thumbs up. So I would like to begin by thanking the sponsors for this uh, talk. We've had some uh, really excellent uh, speakers over the years that we brought to the campus community. And for tonight's event, there are a number of co-sponsors that need to be uh, uh, acknowledged up front. One of those is the Office of the President, uh, Office of Inclusion and Intercultural Initiatives. Another is the Institute for the Study of Christianity and Culture, which uh, of which the uh, head, Dr. Malcolm McGee, is uh, right here. And uh, that's a community uh, 501c3. And we also, because of the community outreach dimension of this talk, uh, it's co-sponsored by the MSU Office of Outreach and Engagement, uh, the College of Arts and Letters, and of course, the Department of Religious Studies. So uh, those are the, the sponsors. I'm very pleased to uh, be able to offer an introduction to Dr. Stephen Prothero, whose works include religious literacy, the namesake of the talk tonight, and also a New York Times best-selling book. Uh, also, God is Not One, uh, and American Jesus. These are among his uh, uh, widely uh, renowned works. He's also known for being a public intellectual. He's a professor at Boston University and in the study of religion, known as an expert in American religion, but he has a public, person, public profile which is uh, uh, probably the highest, uh, or he's the most well-known among scholars of religion in, uh, I think, the country in a lot of respects. He is published in Wall Street Journal, New York Times, he's been on the Colbert Report, all of these uh, uh, are indications of uh, the wide range of impact that he has as a scholar. And uh, I'm very pleased to offer this introduction to Dr. Stephen Prothero. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jesus. And thank you for not mentioning my books that never sold and no one ever read. My history of Christian in America, that was a real that was a real humdinger. I was talking about one of the faculty members here a minute ago. Uh, you know, I enjoyed it and my uh, my mother enjoyed it, but that was about all. I enjoyed it. So uh, I'm grateful to all the sponsors and to the department the uh, religious studies uh, department for bringing me here. Um, as you know, I'm going to talk about religious literacy. Before I do that, I want to just make a couple notes ahead of time, and I want to make a distinction that I actually don't just talk about it in the book that I figured out I needed to make when I started to talk about it in public, and that is a distinction about two different ways to talk about uh, religion. And I just want to make clear that the sort of way that I will be talking about religion, so if you want me to be talking another way, you can can leave or you can frown the whole time or whatever. But uh, the way that we mostly talk about religion in the United States and around the world is, a, is the religious way of talking about religion. This is the way that preachers in church talk about religion or people in Sunday school. If you go to a synagogue or a mosque or a church, you're likely to hear this kind of talk about religion. It's the kind of talk that people inside a religious community engage in with one another about the things that they know to be true. Uh, but religious studies is different from that. Religious studies is not spoken on behalf, it's not religion talk on behalf of a particular community. So it's different from it's different from uh, Sunday school. So there's a religious way of talking about religion and then there's a non-religious or academic way of talking about religion. And I'm gonna be doing I'm gonna be doing the latter today. And it turns out to be an important distinction if you want to talk about religion in the public schools or in fact in a, in a state university like, like Michigan State. 
for that distinction. So I want to uh, talk today about religious literacy in two ways, uh, three ways. I want to talk about the problem of religious illiteracy. I want to talk about the path that produced the problem. And then I want to make a proposal. So those three things. I want to talk about, about the problem of religious ignorance. Why is it a problem? Uh, how did we get to this place by talking about the past? And then I want to make some proposals about how we uh, might address the problem. And as a way into that, I want to talk a little bit about how I got interested in this, in this issue and how it sort of came to me to start to seem to be a problem. And it really happened when I moved from my first academic job in Atlanta, Georgia State University. I moved to Boston University about, about 18 years ago. And I noticed for the first time that my students didn't seem to understand what I was talking about. And I now realize in retrospect probably my Georgia State students didn't understand what I was talking about either. But I was young and energetic enough to not notice. But once I got to Boston University, I sort of noticed that my students didn't really seem to understand what I was talking about. So I would say Matthew. Uh, thinking of the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament of the Christian Bible, and they would be thinking, you know, Matthew Perry of Friends. You know, that was the, the era of Friends. And I would say Luke, and they would be thinking, you know, Luke Perry of uh, Beverly Hills 90210. And the, the main thing that they would do that made me realize they didn't know what I was talking about is that they would give me the look. And I think you all know what the look is. This look is um, how you look when someone says something, and you know you're supposed to know what they just said, but you really don't understand what they just said, but you don't want them to, to know that you don't know what they just said. Right? That's the look, right? And it's it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like this. <laughs> so they would uh, they would do that to me, and so I decided that I needed to uh, figure out. This is sort of a teaching one on one, right? Start where the students are. So I had to figure out what my students knew about religion. Like, what kind of basic information did they have about the Bible, or about Christianity, or Judaism, or Islam? You know, what what did they know? And so I devised this quiz right here that you. Um, I guess it's not really in the full form of a quiz. Oh yeah, it is. Oh, that's okay. So you should have got this um, when you came in. If you didn't, someone near you will be able to show you theirs. This is a religious literacy quiz. I gave it to my students, not for grades, but they would walk into my class the first day. I would give it to them just to see what they knew. And I, and I tried to actually come up with the easiest questions I could come up with about religion. So what are the four gospels? And then me, okay, I'm a religious studies professor, seems like an easy question. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So I asked that. You know, uh, name the holy book of Islam. I thought that was sort of easy. It wasn't. I wasn't coming. I wasn't, in other words, trying to come up with, you know, what year did Muhammad die or something. Like a, a hard question. I was trying to come up with easy, easy questions. And what I found is that my students did very poorly on this quiz. And in fact, uh, I think I have the results on the back. Yes. Uh, basically, nine out of ten of, of my uh, students failed this quiz in the sense that they got below 60 on the quiz. So my students really didn't know, didn't have, coming into my classroom, they didn't have what I would consider to be very basic information uh, about the world's religions. And so then I decided, all right, I should look elsewhere. I shouldn't just be looking only at my Boston University students. So I, I have two daughters, and I decided I would use them as uh, you know, guinea pigs of the sort. And so I thought I'd figure out what they knew. Now, I, my father was a medical doctor, and he had this policy that you just didn't talk about your work when you came home, because you, there was, I don't know why, there was some, some reason. Must have been a good reason. And I, I realized as I was thinking this through, well, I kind of do that too. You know, I'm a religious studies professor, I have these daughters, but I don't really talk about religion with them. You know, I try to talk about things that they, you know, dance or soccer um, if you're really interested in. So uh, it was Bible Day at a local Lutheran uh, church on Cape Cod where the Bible Sunday in the Lutheran church and you give a Bible to second 
graders who have previously been baptized. And in the, in the baptismal ritual, the initiation ritual, the parents promise to put the scriptures in the hands of their children. So this is a moment when you can make good, community makes good on that promise, right? You, you promise to give the Bible to the kids. And so on Bible Sunday, you actually do that. So my daughter uh, was standing up by the altar, and I was standing next to her. And they gave me this Bible to give to her. It was a uh, children's Bible. It had a picture of Jesus on the cover. Um, I mean, it wasn't actually Jesus. They didn't have photography back then, but it was, uh, and it actually didn't look like Jesus. It actually kind of looked like me, by my say, with a beard, like a white, a tall white guy with a beard, uh, with uh, a lamb on his shoulder, and children kind of, white children, kind of adoring and looking, looking up at him, you know. So this was the Bible. And so, you know, I give her the Bible, and she's very proud. And we get in the car, and I'm driving home, and I'm thinking, good, you know, this is a teachable moment. And uh, I said, let's talk about the Bible. And she said, okay. And I said, I want you to tell me some Bible characters. And she said, okay. And I said, but not Jesus, that's too easy. And so I'm driving, and she's sitting in the back seat, and it's silent. And then uh, she coughs. No. <clears throat> and then I look in the mirror and she's looking like this. <laughs> and then she coughs again. <clears throat> and then she says, Tom! <laughs> and then I'm thinking, I'm thinking, Tom? You know, and then, you know, I'm her father, right? So I want there to be something good there, you know? So I'm thinking, okay, you know, Gavin Thomas, you know, maybe he was Tom to his friends. You know, Tom. <laughs> that was it. That was it. Jesus and Tom. That's all I got. <laughs> so then I, um, then I started to try and look around, you know, broaden my horizons beyond my children and beyond my boss. University students, and I found that there, were, there actually are some surveys that include questions about religious knowledge. There's a lot of surveys you might have read, some of these, about religious belief and religious practice. And do you believe in God? Do you believe the Bible is true? These kinds of questions. Uh, how often do you go to church? And we, we have a lot of a lot of those. By, by the way, the, on the surveys about how often you go to church. Uh, one of the most interesting things about that is that, two interesting things actually, is that first of all, people lie about whether they go to church in surveys, but then they lie about it in an exactly predictable amount. So they actually just double how often they go to church. So if they tell you that they go uh, twice a month, they actually go once a month. So just a little side side effect. A friend of mine figured that out by going around and counting the, uh, the cars that churches all around uh, the United States to figure the average number of people in, the, in each car. Anyway, um, there were, in some of these old surveys that were about religious belief and about religious practice, there were some questions about religious knowledge. So I learned, before I wrote my, my book, as I was still sort of, in, you know, investigating this, uh, you know, I learned that you know most uh, Americans do not uh, cannot name the four Gospels. Uh, a lot of Americans, about ten or fifteen percent, think that uh, Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Uh, most cannot name the first book of the Bible as Genesis. So very basic uh, information. Uh, about religion, uh, we uh, we really didn't know. I mean, it seemed to me there's some data about this uh, before I started looking, uh, working on my project. Now, since that, uh, uh, well, and then and then to go back to my quiz for a second, uh, as I was quizzing my students, I was also really interested in uh, their knowledge of the Bible and particularly Bible stories, because I think that's something that you are supposed to learn, you know, if you go to Sunday school or if you've taken a Bible course. And so I had this section at the end 
uh, match the Bible characters with the stories in which they appear. So I have Adam and Eve in the left column, and the right column I have the Garden of Eden. So to get credit there, you have to you know draw a line between Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden. And one thing I saw with my students is that they really they were very they were very bad at this. You know they they had you know Moses uh, was you know blinded on the road to Damascus, and Paul was parting the Red Sea, and had a lot of students who, uh, when they did this survey, they would just start in the left column with Jesus and they would just draw a line to every story in the right column. You know, I guess they figured, you know, they had, they had actually heard of Jesus and, uh, you know, maybe he had something to do with these various, various stories. So as I was gathering this information, I talked with a colleague of mine. He was from Austria. He had just come to the United States to teach a course on the history of the relations between Orthodox Christians and Roman Catholic Christians. He was actually actually Catholic himself. He was an advisor to the Pope, very knowledgeable about Christian history. And he was so excited to come and teach this course. It was about two weeks into the semester. And we were talking about the Xerox machine. And he said to me, I can't teach this course. I just can't do it because my students, half of whom were in the seminary in the Boston University School of Theology said they don't know anything about Christianity. They don't know the most basic thing about Christianity. They don't know anything about Christian history. And I, all I can do is teach an intro to Christianity course. I can't actually teach this course that I came all the way from Austria so excited to teach. He said, here in the United States, so many people go to church, but they don't know anything about Christianity, whereas in, in Austria, nobody goes to church. And yet they have a wealth of knowledge about Christianity and the world's religions because they have required courses they have to take as young people during their uh, public education about Christianity and the, uh, and the world's religions. In more recent years, after my book came out, there was a survey that was done uh, that I consulted with the uh, Pew Forum on a survey called the U.S. Religious Knowledge Survey, which came out in 2010. And this was actually the first survey that was done of American religious knowledge. It was the first time there was an effort to devote a survey to what we know rather than what we do or what we believe about our religion. There were 32 questions. The average score on the quiz was 16, 16 out of 32, which for math majors out there, that would be 50% which would also be flunking. And uh, I remember when Pew was uh, writing their executive report, I was involved in the discussion, and I said, well, you know, it should be, you know, the title of it should be Americans Flunk Religion Quiz. You know, and they said, no, we can't do it. It's too judgmental. You know, we're just social scientists. We just have to, just have to give the facts. So uh, they came out with a survey. It said 16 out of 32. Uh, the best group, the group that scored highest, and any guesses on the group that would score the highest? Yes, atheists, that's right. Atheist agnostics did the best on the quiz, a little bit above the average. And um, uh, Jewish uh, and Mormon uh, participants also did better, above average. Catholics did the worst on the quiz. We have, we have any Catholics here today? Any, any people who want to confess up? Yes, okay. You did the worst. <laughs> on the quiz. Uh, There were questions on the quiz like, uh, what is the um, holy book of Islam? This quiz was done nine years after 9-11, after we supposedly were having this national debate about Islam for almost a decade. And only half of the people knew that the Quran, slightly above half, 54%, that the Quran is the holy uh, book of Islam. Um, We didn't ask whether the Pope was Catholic, but we did ask, well, what's the religion of the Dalai Lama? And most Americans did not know that he was Buddhist. A lot of a lot of people thought he was Jewish, the Dalai Lama. <laughs> so um, the troubling thing too about this is that religious uh, lack of religious knowledge, religious ignorance, is not confined to my daughters or to uh, Boston University students or even to um, average uh, Americans. Also, we have instances in the last decade of political leaders who show, American political leaders who show astonishing ignorance about very basic information about um, Islam. 
this gentleman uh, named Howard Dean, who uh, was for a time running the Democratic National Party. I don't think he still is, but but he was for a time. He was asked when he was running for president, uh, what was his favorite book? This is the time when Democrats were all trying to be all religious. I'll talk a little more about that later, but but you know, what's his favorite book in the New Testament? And he said the book of Job, which is a good answer in the sense that it's in the Bible, but it's a bad answer in the sense that it's in the Old Testament. It's not in the, it's not in the, yeah, the New Testament. So that was that for Howard Dean. And then this gentleman from Texas, also a Democrat, Sylvester Reyes, uh, was being appointed to the House Intelligence Committee just a few days before he was appointed to, to actually to run the House Intelligence Committee. Uh, he was asked about Al-Qaeda, and a reporter just asked him a factual question, is Al-Qaeda a Sunni or a Shia Muslim group? And uh, he said, he, he kind of halted for a minute, and then he said, uh, Shia, which would be wrong. Um, and so here's the guy who's about to run the House Intelligence Committee, he doesn't have some of the most basic information uh, about, uh, about Islam, or in this case, about Al-Qaeda. Okay. So why does this matter? I mean, this is something that uh, professors like to do, right? We like to, you know, make fun of people who don't know what we don't know, right? That's that's what we do. So, is that all this is, or does this actually have uh, some import? And I would argue that religious illiteracy does matter because religion matters. So, religion is, as we all know, an important matter in the private lives of billions of people, the vast majority of the world's population. Uh, people who love uh, Jesus, people who submit to Allah, people who uh, observe the Jewish commandments, people who worship Krishna. But religion also has uh, public power. It moves elections in India, as we've seen recently in India and in the United States, it moves military forces around the globe. How, from an economic perspective, can you make sense of the so-called brick economies without knowing something about Confucianism in, in um, China, Hinduism in India, Christian Orthodoxy in Russia, Catholicism in, in Brazil? How to make sense of Tibet without knowing something about uh, Buddhism? And so atheists are on, especially the new atheist writers, are on of saying that religion is the greatest force or, or evil in world history. I think there's actually a good argument to be made to that effect. But I would also argue that religion may be among the greatest forces for good in world history. And if you accept both of those factors, what you're saying is religion is a powerful force um, indeed, and we need to uh, we need to recognize it. So religion may or may not make sense to you, but you can't make sense of the world without making sense um, sense of religion. And so I wrote my book, Religious Literacy, an attempt to address this problem of religious uh, illiteracy in a world in which religion is not, it's not normal. Okay, so let me say a little more about the problem before I talk about the past and the proposal. The problem of religious illiteracy can be viewed from a lot of different angles. And one way it's seen pretty widely is a religious problem for religious communities, right? So if you are a born-again Christian, if you're an evangelical, and you have children, and you believe the Bible is the word of God, and you can't get them to understand the first thing about the Bible, you have a problem, right? Because you're in a tradition where the central source of authority is the text, and the next generation is not reading or understanding the text. That's a problem for you, right? Similarly, if you are Jewish, and you are trying to raise your kids Jewish, and they have never heard of Moses. They have never looked at the Hebrew Bible. They don't know anything about the Talmud. Um, you, again, have a problem. And so there's actually a lot of writing on religious illiteracy by Catholics, by evangelicals, by Jews, uh, in books about Jewish illiteracy, or Catholic illiteracy, or biblical uh, illiteracy. But that's not the problem I'm talking about in my book or at this talk uh, today. Uh, a second problem of religious illiteracy is what I call the liberal arts problem. This is the problem of how do you understand a work of art, a novel, a play, a movie, 
uh, without knowing something about the religions that inform it. And in the West, the religions that have largely informed those um, sources of art and literature has have been Judaism and Christianity, particularly Christianity. So you, know, you go to uh, a museum and you look at pictures made before 1960, you know, in many cases, those are going to be biblical stories. And if you don't know the story, you know, why is that guy in that big boat? You know, it seems crowded with a lot of animals. What's happening there? Um, you're just going to, you're going to just be kind of confused, right? Similarly, if you look at uh, some arena of pop culture, like, like um, Oprah Winfrey's book club, and you just look at titles in that, Books like uh, East of Eden or um, Song of Solomon. These are uh, books that even in their titles require some literacy, some knowledge about the Bible in order to make sense of even the, uh, the title itself. So this is a kind of liberal arts problem. It's also not the subject of my talk or the subject of my book. The way I look at the problem of religious illiteracy is as a civic problem. A problem for uh, the American public life. I think it's a problem for our politics and for our public uh, discourse that we live in a society that is so deeply religious, and yet we are so have such widespread ignorance about religion, about our own religions, and about the uh, religions of other people. So my focus then is if religious illiteracy as a civic problem that imperils us in two ways. The first is at home, and the second is abroad. And I want to talk about each of those. Uh, a little bit. So the problem at home, as I see it, is this: that we we have a history uh, throughout America of talking about religion in public, but that became particularly acute in the late 1970s when Republicans got together and said, "We need to talk more about God. We need to talk more about the Bible. We need to talk more about what we are going to call family values." And we're going to draw connections between the Bible and the abortion question, between the Bible and homosexuality, between the Bible and contraception. And we're going to position ourselves as the anti-60s libertinism party. That the Democrats are the kind of sex, drug, and rock and roll, moral world, and crazy people. And we are the God, the God team over here in the GOP. And that happened, and that produced what, what in the media uh, were, was called the culture wars. And the Democrats responded by saying, by going back to Thomas Jefferson and other people in American history and said, religion is a private matter. We're not supposed to do this in public. We're not supposed to talk about religion in public. It's not supposed to be, you know, what religion are you, Mr. Person is running for president before I decide whether to vote for you. That's supposed to be irrelevant. It's supposed to be private. On the Jeffersonian theory, on the Democratic Party theory, and so, increasingly, the Republicans were talking about God and the Bible and Christianity, and Democrats were refusing to do so. Now, this turned out to be a bad strategy in a country where 95% of the people believe in God. It's not so good to be the anti-God party. And so, after John Kerry lost in 2004, making very fitful and difficult attempts to talk about his Catholicism, where he looked like an uncomfortable New Englander talking about his religion in public when New Englanders don't do that, uh, and lost to someone, uh, President Bush, who did know how to do that you know, in public. The Democrats decided they were going to shift and they were going to get religion too. And so we saw um, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama debating uh, in the Bible and talking about values and talking about their faith and saying that they believed in Jesus and Jesus was their savior and Hillary Clinton saying that she was opposed to Republican initiatives on immigration because they violated the Good Samaritan story. Because the Good Samaritan story says, here's a stranger in your midst, you're supposed to take care of them. And the Republican initiative was saying, here's a stranger in your midst, you're supposed to turn them in to the immigration authorities. How can we vote for that bill? It's not, it's not Christian. This is not a way that Democrats were used to talking in my lifetime. And so, as a result, what we have is two religious political parties in the United States. They both try to draw connections between the Bible, Christianity, and their particular, particular public policy 
uh, initiatives. And so all sorts of debates that we have are now religiously inflected, not just the debates about gay marriage or about stem cell research or about abortion that, that would seem to have some direct connection to religion, but also debates about war, about torture, about taxes, about poverty. And we can't understand these debates. We can't participate fully as citizens in a democracy unless we understand what these politicians are saying. Does it make any sense? What is, who is the Good Samaritan? Does that story tell us what Hillary Clinton is telling us? It tells us, how, how would we know? Unless we have some independent understanding of that particular story. And so there's a sort of distance that's created between our politics and ourselves that is unhealthy. Now this could be solved by getting religion out of the public space, right? Some people were in favor of that, but that is actually not the American tradition. We've always sort of muddled through with something between a kind of a religion is private thing, leave it out, and uh, most of us are Christians, so let's whoop it up and we're one nation under God. We've always kind of muddled through in the middle there. Another thing that happens because of our religious illiteracy, because of our lack of understanding, in this case of Christianity and the Bible, because politicians, as you might have noticed, are not really talking about the Bhagavad Gita of Hinduism when they're running for office. They're not really talking about the Buddha. Um, they're talking about Jesus. They're talking about the Bible, the Christian Bible. They're talking about Christianity. Um, the gap there also encourages politicians to talk more and more about religion in the public space. Because we don't know enough, sorry, we don't know enough to say, whoa, 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 why are we doing, why are we pretending the Bible is saying that about abortion? You know, um, where does it say anything about abortion in the Bible? You know, we don't know enough about the Bible to interrogate the connections that are being made. And so, so politicians realize there's something to be gained from doing religion in public, from quoting the Bible or evoking the Bible. And there's very little to be lost, because there isn't going to be a gotcha moment when somebody says, now wait a minute, it doesn't actually say that there. That really doesn't have anything to do with tax policy. You know? So that's the problem as I see it on the home, home front. Now, on abroad, religious literacy is even more important problem, even more dangerous problem, because we live in a world that is furiously religious. We can't understand what's going on in Kashmir. We have two nuclear powers, one, the Hindu majority state of India, the other, the Muslim majority um, state of Pakistan. We can't understand what's going on there in, in contest over Kashmir without knowing something about Hinduism and Islam. We can't understand what's going on in the Middle East, in Israel, in the Palestinian territories without knowing something about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. These are not purely economic or political conflicts. These are also religious conflicts. The same goes in Sri Lanka, where we've had a generation of killing between Buddhists and Hindus, or in Myanmar, where we're increasingly hearing of uh, violence between uh, Buddhists toward Muslims. And of course, the so-called war on terror, the, the, the big story of, of world uh, history in the last uh, you know, decade and a half. How do we understand that without knowing some basic information about Islam, about the Sunni and the Shia? inside Islam. Now, Madeleine Albright, who was the Secretary of State under Bill Clinton, she has a book out that's called The Mighty and the Almighty, and it's about uh, foreign policy and religion. And she talks about how when she was Secretary of State, she had hundreds of advisors who could talk to her about the GDP in uh, Dubai or about political parties in India. But how many religion advisors did she have to talk to about Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism? Zero. She had no religious advisors. So if she had a problem to solve on religion, I guess she would go to Wikipedia. You know, she would um, ask her grandmother. You know, I mean, she didn't know anything about uh, religion, and there was no way to uh, to figure it out. You know, or no obvious way to figure it out. Now this makes sense as a Secretary of State if 
global politics is driven by fear and greed. In other words, if global politics can be understood through the lenses of money and power, through the disciplines of economics and political science, it makes sense not to have advisors in religion, if that is the case. But I, as you can probably guess, will argue that is not the case. That human beings throughout world history and today, most of them are religiously motivated. And countries motivate and move uh, religious resources as well as economic and political resources to get their people to do various things. And so you can understand what's going on in Israel and the Palestinian territories and pretend that it's purely economic and political. It's not. It's also religious. And the same in the countries that I talked about uh, earlier. Uh, this uh, reminds me of John Kerry, who is now Secretary of State. And this is my shameless plug for uh, religious studies courses. How many of you have, have taken a religious studies course here? Nice, many of you. John Kerry, if I went back to college today, he said about a year ago, I think I would probably major in comparative religion. Because that's how integrated it is in everything that we are working on and deciding and thinking about in life today. You realize that as Secretary of State, it's an important area of human knowledge that needs to be attended to if you want to understand the world. And that's why he created a unit inside the State Department called the Office of Faith-Based Community in uh, Initiatives. That, um, actually, that's not the name. But there's a unit inside the State Department that's like the uh, old Office of Faith-Based Community Initiatives started by uh, President um, Clinton and then continued by President Bush that is charged with informing people in the State Department, including the Secretary of State, about uh, religious questions. Now, it should be noted that this diversity that we see in the world is not just out there, but it's also, it's also here. It's also here in the United States as well. In Michigan, we obviously have substantial Protestant and Catholic communities, but this is also the birthplace of Seventh-day uh, Adventism. It's also the home of the largest mosque um, in the United States, the Islamic um, Center of America in Dearborn. Um, and in Dearborn, I was, I was talking with some faculty members um, earlier, close to a third of the population in Dearborn speaks Arabic. Um, many of those who speak Arabic, by the way, are Christians um, in, in Dearborn. But, um, and nearly half of the public school children in the um, school district in Dearborn are practitioner of, practitioners of Islam. Okay, so shift, quick shift to the past. This is the moment most of you who are allergic to uh, history, which is what I do, can uh, just like take a quick nap, like one of those power naps that you know, re-energizes you, those like five minute power naps. So if you're really just totally allergic to history and you're going to be annoyed with me, I promise this will only be short, short and relatively painless. But the way I think about these problems is always historical. So I'm going to give you my quick uh, reading of how this came to be. How did it come to be that a country with the most Christians on earth, arguably the most religious country ever in terms of numbers, certainly one of the most religious countries. How did it come to be that we know so little about our own religion and the religions of other people? How did that paradox come to be? So here's my argument in brief. First of all, we were not always like this. So if you go back to the colonial period, where I'm from in Massachusetts, and the early national period, Americans knew a lot about Christianity and the Bible. Now, I'm not going to pretend they knew a lot about Islam, because they didn't. They did talk about Islam. Thomas Jefferson uh, was said in the election of 1800 to be a Muslim. You might have heard of that happening to another president. It happened first to Thomas Jefferson. It was one of the slurs that was used against him in the election of 1800. Many homes in the colonial period had no book. And those that had a book, the book would be the Bible. And so there were many homes where if you wanted to learn to read, the way you would learn to read is you would memorize the 23rd Psalm in the Bible. And then your mother or father would open up to the page of the 23rd Psalm after having taught you some of the sounds that went along with the letters. And you would read, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
And if you already knew what you had, then you would be reading it off one page. So the Bible was the instructional book for reading that was used. So literally, literacy, the acquisition of the capacity to read and to write, came with biblical literacy in the colonial period and the early national, in the early national period. And you can see this in our public life, in our debate over uh, slavery, which was a debate about the Bible, where both sides understood that if they could prove that the Bible was on their side, that they would win the debate. Because the authority of the Bible wasn't questioned in the 1850s and the 1860s in, in the United States. And you compare the level, you know, the debate we have now about Islam, it's basically, uh, you know, Islam is a religion of peace, and then that one person says that, and then the other person on, uh, you know, Crossfire or Hardball, one of those shows that sounds like it was named by, by adolescent boy, the other, the other um, side says, no, Islam is a religion of war, and then the other side has a great counter-argument, which is, Islam is a religion of peace, and then the other side has a, has a really intriguing counter-argument, which is, you know, Islam is a religion of war. And that's basically what we do in our public conversations about Islam. Why? Because we don't know anything about Islam. Because we haven't read the Quran. Because we, because we don't understand uh, schools of Islamic jurisprudence. So we can't have a conversation. But we used to have conversations about the Bible that were very sophisticated. If you look at the biblical debates over slavery, both sides had good arguments. And they marshaled them. People understood them. People made allusions to them, including President Lincoln. So there was a period when we understood a lot about Christian theology and um, the Bible. But then there was a decline. The typical story that you hear is that the decline of our uh, biblical and Christian literacy was started by the Supreme Court. It was started when the court in 1962 and 1963 outlawed prayer and devotional Bible reading in the public schools, banned God from the public schools. In other words, our religious illiteracy was caused by secular religion haters on the left who wanted to take away the public influence of religion. That's how it happened. And what I argue in the book is that he was incorrect. And then actually, uh, the process started over a century earlier. And it started not with secular people, but it started with religious people. And the religious people it started with were born again Christians with evangelicals. And it started in the period that's typically uh, known among, in my field of American religious history as the Second Great Awakening. This is a period of real evangelistic fervor, a lot of people converting. Happens between, say, 1800 and 1840s. And in this period, religion becomes a lot more emotional, less about doctrine, more about feeling. It becomes about loving Jesus rather than uh, listening to what um, Jesus has to say. It becomes more and more about morality, less and less about um, theology. There's a shift from the head to the heart. And so where I was earlier in American history, there was always this intellectual tradition in uh, the Christian communities where they were all debating what the Bible said and then you get this move where religion kind of goes, moves from year to year. And so it becomes increasingly less important to know what the Bible says or to be engaged in Christian doctrinal faith because this is also a period growing out of the Second Great Awakening when the Protestants are trying to Protestantize the country, trying to make it more and more Christian. And it isn't useful to be debating between you know, Calvinists and Lutherans about you know, their views of Holy Communion or their views of agency and salvation or that kind of stuff. It just gets in the way of you know, getting tracts to people and giving them Bibles and you know, doing rid of, getting rid of alcohol and you know, making the country a more Protestant um, sort of place. Now, if you've taken a quick nap, that's the end of the history portion. If you want to ask more about that, when we get to question and answers in a couple minutes, I'd be happy to talk more about history. That's my main argument. So what's, what's the proposal? So the proposal 
is that we um, we need to uh, study religion in our public institutions. And one of the main public institutions we have for education, as you know, is the public schools. And I think we should have two courses, two mandatory courses in our public schools. One on, one on the Bible, which would address our civic problem of religious illiteracy at home, where the Bible is used so much by politicians to, I would say, manipulate us, among other things. Uh, and then we need a world religions course to help us understand the world, and helps us understand the religious diversity we see as well in the United States. I think we should have these courses. I don't think you're an educated person unless you know some basic information about the Bible and some basic information about the world's religions. I think you are wrong about yourself if you think you're educated and you don't have some of that basic information. If you can't engage in a conversation, and that's what I mean by religious literacy, is the capacity to engage, intelligently engage in a conversation. That's what's missing in our debates about Islam. We don't have Islamic literacy enough to have an intelligent conversation. I'm not asking for any given outcome in these debates, just asking for a, a, the capacity to intelligently engage as an informed citizen in this uh, conversation. We do have a school district in Modesto, California that has a mandatory course and instituted about five years ago in World Religions, it's a ninth grade course, it's mandatory. They do have an opt-out provision where a parent can object. There's about a thousand students that take the course every year. It's usually three students, two or three or four students a year who opt out. So most everybody takes it. It's a school district with a lot of born again Christians, a lot of South Asian um, students who are either Hindu or Sikh. And it's the kind of place you might expect a sort of culture war over religion, right? With religious diversity at the same time of like a strong Christian uh, majority. And that's been a very successful course. We've studied, studied it both in terms of its uh, what it's done to the community, is it divisive, and then also in terms of our people actually learning something and we're getting good outcomes on both of those. Now, the objection, the biggest objection that I hear to public school courses in religious studies, and in my view, I'm not talking, again, to go back to where I started, I'm not talking about Sunday school course. I'm not talking about a course about why Jesus is the greatest human God ever, right? I'm talking about you know courses that would be academic courses where you would learn information about Buddhism and about Islam, right? You wouldn't be learning how to be a Buddhist. You wouldn't be learning how to be a Muslim or how to not be a Muslim. The biggest objection is a constitutional objection that this is somehow unconstitutional. We have separation of church and state, private schools, our state-run institutions. You can't do this. You can't, religion is supposed to be separate. That's what separation of church and state means. And in fact, if you look at this 2010 Pew survey on US religious knowledge, they actually asked two questions about this. They asked uh, if you can, is it, is it constitutional to teach a Bible as literature course? And three quarters of Americans think it's unconstitutional to teach a Bible course in the, in the public high schools. And then they ask, is it constitutional to teach a world religions course? And two thirds of Americans think that it's unconstitutional to teach a world religions course. Now this is just wrong. It's not an interpretive question, it's just factually incorrect. But the overwhelming majority of Americans think that it's illegal to teach the two courses that I just said should be mandatory. So there's this weird catch-22 that our religious literacy is so bad that we think we can't even teach about it in the public schools, which makes our religious illiteracy even worse. Now, the Supreme Court has uh, spoken on this, and it's made many rulings about religion in public education. This is not a topic it doesn't deal with. It deals with this topic fairly regularly. And virtually every time it deals with a topic, when it says something like, you can't do a devotional, you can't do a prayer, the principal can't get on the intercom and do a prayer for everybody in the school, because that violates the First Amendment separation of uh, disestablishment laws. Can't do that. 
But then it goes on and talks about the things you can do. And here's what it says in the Supreme Court case in 1963 against the devotional reading of the Bible. When, it, when it's making a distinction between the devotional reading of the Bible and the teaching a course about the Bible, which is different, right? You stand up and say, here's a reading from the Blessed Gospel of John. And you, you speak it, and everybody's supposed to be in awe, and you speak it, and now you're done. Right? That's what's unconstitutional. But here we are. There are four Gospels. This is the fourth. This is the Gospel of John. We can read it, and we're going to compare it with the Gospel of Luke that we read yesterday. Right? What do you do in a, in a, in a Bible course? Here's what uh, Supreme Court Justice Tom Clark says in this case from 1963, outlined devotional Bible reading. He says, it might well be said that one's education is not complete without a study of comparative religion or the history of religion and its relationship to the advancement of civilization. It certainly may be said that the Bible is worthy of study for its literary and historic qualities. Nothing we have said here indicates that such study of the Bible or of religion, when presented objectively as part of a secular program of education, may not be affected consistently with the First Amendment. So not only is it is it constitutionally kosher to teach a course about the Bible or about religion? It should be done, says the Supreme Court. This is actually unusual. The court doesn't usually get into this business, right? They're usually trying to talk about what's legal. But in this case, they kind of give their imprimatur. Like, this is something we should be doing. Don't misunderstand us to be saying. We can't be teaching about religion. We can do that. We just can't be preaching religion. That's what we can't do. Okay, so let me conclude. Let me shift from my policy proposal. And then when we're done, we have a mic here. And we'll be able to have questions. If you have a question, you can come down. We can all hear you with your question. So what about uh, what about individuals? You know, what about you? I, I mean, I think we want to extend this this conversation about teaching about religion in the public schools to teaching about religion in also colleges and our, in our private and, and public universities. I think that we should be teaching about religious studies as well in our colleges. I don't think, as I said before, you're an educated person if you walk out with a bachelor's degree from Michigan State or from Boston University and you, and you don't know two or three salient differences between Sunni and Shia and you don't know that the Quran is the Holy Book of Islam. So what about individuals, though? So my challenge to you would be, OK, a few things. Um, how about reading the Quran before uh, you leave college? It's actually not that hard. I mean, it's hard to read it in Arabic if you don't read Arabic. But you, know, you can read a translation in English. Uh, it's not that long. Uh, you know, sometimes you think about a Bible, you imagine it's long. Like reading the Christian Bible, you can't really do it on a weekend. But you can you can read the Quran on a weekend. You know, it depends what else you're doing on your weekend, but you can do that. It's not that long. So that's one thing. Think about that. All this conversation, you know, Ben Affleck, you know, is not just filming Batman movies. He's also talking about Islam on television. So you could be in on that conversation if you, you know, did some reading of the Quran. Another is to read the Bible. Now the Bible is longer, so I have a I have a little trick about the Bible that um, I don't know if we have any people here who teach um, biblical studies. They're going to get mad at me. Okay, sorry in advance. Here's my little Spark Notes guide to the Bible. You know, if you don't want to read the whole Bible, read Genesis and Matthew, only two books of the Bible. In these two books of the Bible, you will find 90% of the, the stories and the characters that show up in American conversations about the Bible. Matthew is the book that has the parables, the stories that we attach ourselves to, and Genesis is the, that like font of these stories that show up in uh, in uh, movies and TV shows, you know, like Noah's Ark. So if you just read those two books, which takes even less time, way less time than reading the Quran, 
You know, you can be in on those, you know, know those basic Bible characters, basic Bible stories, and get some of the illusions that are going on in our uh, American political life. Uh, a third thing, talk with your friends about religion. Now, I know that there's a thing about this, especially, you know, among my Boston University students. You know, not really something you want to talk about because it sort of feels like it's going to get into an argument because in your head you're imagining that religion is about people arguing about things and then you don't want to be one of those people. I mean, you don't want to be one of those people knocking on somebody's door with a, with a piece of paper like trying to convert them into something, right? You don't want to be that person. But that's only one way to talk about religion. There's a lot of other ways to talk about religion. You know, they, they talk about religion on South Park, right? They don't talk about religion that way on South Park. So this is a conversation you can have, you know, especially when something comes up. You know, someone goes to a funeral. Someone uh, is observing a religious holiday. You don't inquire of your um, friend about that. You know, what, like, what's up, what's up for that? So it's something you can do. Uh, another is to get involved with interfaith organizations. This is a way, you know, a lot of campuses have these. This is a way that you can, you can sort of more formally meet people who are of a different faith from your own or who have no faith at all. Increasingly, interfaith organizations are including humanists and atheists and agnostics. If that is descriptive of you, this can be a place where you can engage in religious conversations with your colleagues and friends uh, and learn something about uh, religion along the way. Okay, one last point, and then we'll open it up to uh, two questions and comments for maybe 15 minutes. Um, one of the biggest dangers, in my view, and this is where my bar on this is not very high, one of the things you learn in the humanities is you learn that it's important to know what you don't know, right? If you think about American foreign policy, we were talking about it dinner tonight, you know, one of the big dangers is when we imagine we know stuff we don't know, right? We know how the thing's going to play out in Iraq. We know how the thing's going to play out in Afghanistan. We're going to do this, they're going to do that, then they're going to do that, and that thing will happen, and that thing will happen, right? But one of the most important things you can do as an educated person is to know when you don't know something. And, and so one of the real factors of studying religion, in my view, isn't necessarily you know memorizing the four gospels, but it's sort of knowing that oh okay, there's a book that those people in that religion read. I wonder if that's relevant to this issue I have at hand, right? I'm a business person working in China. I remember a lot of people in China are Confucian. Does that have anything to do with what products they will buy? Does that have anything to do with how they engage with one another? whether we should have a spokesman for this product, be young or be old, maybe that's going to be relevant. And you don't have to know all about Confucianism. You just have to kind of remember, like, oh, yeah, maybe there's something that I should know about this. Right? So I think that's one of my main pleas, is, is to, uh, to know that there's, there's knowledge to be had about religion, and then know when you don't have it, and imagine when it might be worth when it might be worth getting. So that's, that's how I um, see things. That's what I have to say. But as my students say, you know, that's just me. You know, what, if, what about you? What's, what do you think? What do you think about all this? So um, we have a mic. Love to hear comments and questions. Um, if you have a, a question, just don't make sure it's easy. And um, if you have a comment, just make sure it's, uh, it's full of praise <laughs> and um, without any real, you know, harsh criticism. Okay, um, I'm just kidding, but I say that. So, uh, do we have uh, we have a question or a comment? We got a mic up here. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Come on up. Come on up. Yeah. You great. Uh, I really enjoyed your book. So sorry, I'll put on for your uh, idea of teaching on. Um, Google studies in public school. Uh, I'm a non believer, I understand why many other non believers would disagree with this. But how should we appeal and dialogue to people who are on the opposite end who may feel that objectively or non devotion to the Bible is amoral? Who don't want their kids reading up the Bible in a, like an academic sense? They don't want their kids, you mean non believers who don't want their kids reading the Bible? Believers who don't want their children learning objective or secular 
plane and went to a party and somebody asked them what I did and I said it was a religious study professor. You know, they would, if they were uh, at a party, they would just go talk to someone else and then if they were at the plane, they would just, you know, pull out some electronic device and, you know, entertain themselves with that instead of talking to me. But as soon as 9-11 happened, I was like the most popular guy at party on the plane. They get people to shut up. They want information now about, you know, mostly about Islam, but also about other, other religions. So I think there's a moment when you, you may have a perception that the public space, religious phenomena are, are kind of being discouraged in the public space. I have a little different understanding. I think that historically Americans have we've had a pretty, pretty robustly religious public space. That certainly isn't being discouraged by President Obama. He talks about religion quite a bit. Um, and it's not being discouraged by Republicans. So I don't, I think we have a sense that we can do religion in public. I think we have a sense that we are, uh, we have a gap. And, uh, and then I, I think what we don't really know is really how to go about it. You know, I think, I think it's a little bit more of a practical problem. We don't know how to go about it. And we do have worries about the constitutionality question. You know, because we do think that our public schools are supposed to be religion-free zones, and that's not what the Supreme Court said. I don't think that was what the founders, founders intended. So I think that's one of the, that's the main thing that needs to be overcome, is that constitutional confusion. I don't think there's much confusion about whether we're allowed to talk about religion in public. Other questions? Yes. Um, this, this gentleman right here. Hi. Um, thank you. It was really interesting to hear your presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, in the news, oftentimes we see uh, religious extremists um, who have sort of the extreme view that their religion teaches. Uh, do you think that um, the, the abundance of media coverage that that receives can lead people to not want to explore religion at all? So um, could that contribute to um, religion literacy or the lack thereof? Yeah, um, that's good. Um, yes, I think that I, I agree. Um, I think that, first of all, on television, uh, what works is conflict, right? Because that's, you know, you go to dramas, you know, you want to produce conflict. Uh, and so that, that works, and also works on the news side, right? So you want to get, if you're talking about a topic, you want to get two people who will fight with each other, right? You're not looking for the two smartest people on the topic. You're looking maybe for two of the dumbest people on the topic who are on the most extreme so that they can have, a, you know, an, entertaining conversation, right? Uh, and I think that is a, a factor in turning people off uh, from both religion and politics. If you look at data for young people and their affiliation rates over the last uh, generation, and especially over the last decade, you see declines in affiliation both with political parties and in affiliation with religious institutions, right? People don't want to say, people don't want to say, I'm a Methodist, I'm a Christian, um, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, because their association with those brands is with those those idiots on TV that they see arguing about it, right? Whether it's the you know the left Democrat or the right Republican or the extremist Muslim or you know the extremist anti-extremist Muslim Christian, right? So I think that's right. I think that's right, and I, I think that it's, that's not productive of religious literacy, right? Um, what's more productive, and you know, there are, there is an effort by some news organizations to do what they call explainers, you know, and I've written a bunch of these for, you know, CNN and other places, you know, where, okay, something comes up, so, you know, what is that thing? What is that, like, what is Ramadan? Oh, it's Ramadan, you know? What is Ramadan? You know, oh, it's a Muslim holiday. Oh, well, what happens on Ramadan, you know? And that question gets occasion because oh, there's an NBA player and he's not playing in the game tonight because it's Ramadan. And all of a sudden, people at Sports Illustrated want to know what Ramadan is because their favorite player can't play tonight and it's an important game. So there are efforts to do that where the point is kind of an educational point and explain it rather than like a fight, an entertainment, an entertainment fight. But unfortunately, the media is still dominated by that other model, which is the two sides, 
you know, the two sides of the question, which I think in some of these questions are too. We need to stop. I think we have time for one question. So we have one more question. The only, only caveat is it needs to be the best question because it's the last question. This would be a really good one. We have in the middle there, in the middle back, we have a really good, a bold, good, pithy, concise, brilliant, sharp, not too difficult question. Two more, two more. There was someone down front. Well, actually, there we have a lot. We have a number of people in there. Do we need time for two more? Okay. Okay, good. Two more, two more, yes. So no pressure anymore. <laughs> Go ahead. First of all, I really laud you for proposing um, looking at religion from an objective perspective and from a global perspective. I think this will go a long ways for us to look at the interrelationship um, between religions. My, my question is really, I'm a member of the Baha'i faith, and, um, which might be considered a religious minority. So when I hear you proposing that we have classes um, about the Bible and then other um, world religions, um, one cons well, I have two concerns. One is that how, you know, in a country where the Bible, many people are fundamentalists or they're um, really um, immersed in beliefs about the validity of the Bible, can you say that as a, even though technically they're supposed to be objective, how do, how do we keep that objective in a classroom? If I had young children, I would be concerned about that. And then the second question about world religions then, who decides which religions get talked about or taught about in a class? Okay, well that's easy because that would be me. <laughs> Let me talk about the first question. The first question first, if I, if I can remember both of them. Um, yes, and uh, when you have this problem of, okay, we have a constitution, and we have rules uh, of what's constitutional, what's unconstitutional in a public school setting, and it would not be constitutional to teach a Bible course where you got to the end and the person said, now I'm glad you read the Bible, now you know that Jesus is your Savior and Lord, or now you know that Christianity is idiotic and you should all be atheists, right? That would be unconstitutional. So how do we make sure that doesn't happen? Now, here's the argument I usually make about this. You realize we have this problem now, right? Because we have biology classes that are being taught by uh, people who don't believe in creationism. Right? Don't believe in evolution. I'm sorry. Don't believe in evolution. So, um, we already have religious people who are, you know, violating the Constitution in the courses, but those courses might be called American literature or biology. I think the scrutiny of a course called the Bible as literature or world religious is way higher. Right? So it's going to be way more public attention to uh, the constitutionality of that course in the midst of these other courses, which can also violate the Constitution on religious liberty and, and the religious establishment ground. The other thing is you just have to make sure people are educated about how to do this, and you have to, you have to uh, trust the teachers are going to be professional, and then when they're not, that's when I'm glad for the American Civil Liberties Union. I'm glad there'll be some lawyer who will come in and you know, sue the school district and make sure they stop doing that. So that's what I would vote for. Now, as to who get what gets taught, you now you may not be surprised to hear you are not the first Baha'i to ask me whether the Baha'is are going to be included in my course. Okay, because Baha'is come to my lectures because they are interested in the world's religions. Right? For those of you who don't know much about Baha'i, this is a relatively modern religious movement and roots in Iran. Um, and and is uh, one that's very interested in all the world's religions. We, the world's religions all have truths to, to tell, truths to speak. So, um, but I'm not sure other than that you're going to like what I have to say because, because here's how it goes. You know, a class, say it's a half year class in the ninth grade, right? I would be very happy if they did five religions. I would be probably pushed for seven. Um, and those would be not Baha'i. So they would, and, and here's what I would do. I would do the largest
greatest religion in the world. Because, as you know, there's thousands of religions, right? You can't do them all. So, you, 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 that was part of the premise of your question. You have to make a decision. That would be that. And then it would kind of mix it up a little bit based on the lo- local. Is there a particular minority religion that's, that's big locally, that has some influence there, that was established in that state, something like that? And I would do that. But I think I would, I would go for fewer rather than more because I think the key thing is to make people realize there's a bunch of religions that don't believe the same things that have different things. Okay, one here, Dan, this gentleman here, question? Yeah, and then we really don't have to stop. We're taxing the patience of, uh, of you all. <laughs> you listen to me for so long, yes? My career was as a committed academician in religious studies, Bible studies. So that at one level, I want to do the secular equivalent of amen to what you say. At another level, I, as you talked about illiteracy, I wonder if the illiteracy in Bible or religion is any different than the general illiteracy in the humanities, in drama or literature or whatever. And it, our real uphill struggle is that none of them uh, get jobs, and that our our educational institutions are so preoccupied now with uh, vocation that it doesn't matter what. Right. What you get, right. 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 No, and and that is a challenge to uh, the humanities, right? That's a challenge to um, the irrelevant arts, right? The liberal arts. Um, you know, this is where Taoism would help. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a parable in Taoism about the tree, about the useless tree. I don't know if anyone knows this parable. There's this tree that's so gnarly and bent around that, uh, that it, it lives to be hundreds of years old because it's useless. Because you can't cut it up and make a chair out of it. It's got too many knots in it. It's a useless tree. And so it's therefore immortal, right? And I think, I, think that, um, I think that we have this idea that, uh, yeah, that we need to justify uh, our studies on the basis of what's it going to produce, right? So, yeah, I mean, I was the chair of a religious studies department, and I had, uh, you know, angry parents calling me when their kid shifted from engineering to religious studies. You know, why am I paying all this money so my kid can get out of college and not have a job? And I, and I agree, it's a concern. And I actually do think, you know, I mean, college is not just a place for, uh, you know, fun and you know, fun and learning. You know, it is a place that people see as preparation for for labor, for the labor market. So we need to take that seriously. I think it's short-sighted to think that what's required in the, in the labor market is just, you know, um, the STEM disciplines. And and I, I think if you have it, your Bill Gates and the founders of Google and the founder and you know Mark Zuckerberg, I think they would probably agree with you and me. They don't need a bunch of computer. I mean, they need some computer scientists at Google, but they, what they actually need is creative people. You know, Google employs. You know, uh, you have, have any of you ever used Google? <laughs> you know, Google. Somebody draws those things on the on the page on the front page of Google. Those pictures every day. Those new. Those new illustrations, they employ a bunch of artists, illustrators to do that. Those aren't people with degrees in you know, science and engineering. You know, and, and they, need, they need smart people in those places who understand the world. They're trying to move into China. They're trying to compete with uh, you know, Alibaba. If they're eBay or they're Google or wherever they might be. They need to know something about China to do that. They need to know something about Confucianism to understand China. So, um, so I would think, you know, I would make that sort of plea that uh, yes, I agree, and, and I think that's part of the problem of religious literacy. That's related to the problem of our illiteracy about great American novels and our literacy about great American plays. You know, but I, I would still make a plea though that uh, you know, in our in our uh, public schools, we have always changed the curriculum. You know, when I went to public school, I took home economics. And I took a shot, it was required. A year of woodworking and a year of metalworking. That's no longer required in my public school. Um, computer science, we didn't have computer science. 
And we had the computer science course too. The computer was like the size of this room. And it spit out little pieces of chads and papers. And so very primitive. Uh, but now we teach computer science in our public schools. So our, um, similarly, when public schools began in the 1840s you know, and 30s, we were part of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. In our public high schools, Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Why? You need to know the classics, and you need to be able to read the Bible. And the Bible was not written in English. We don't do that anymore, because our priorities have shifted. So similarly, I think our priorities should shift. We live in a world where religion matters, and where religion is powerful. And uh, given that, to be citizens of the world, citizens of the country, we need to know something about it. So, thank you all for coming and starting out.